to um, declare the meeting open to the public online. And I'd like to welcome members who are participating by telephone conferencing today in order to help us observe the social distancing. And those members today are Orlea Flynn, Pat Sheehan and Colin McGrath. And can I remind all members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices? Members, given the pressure of time today, I propose that we go uh, straight to item number five, which is our COVID disease response and an update from the Minister of Health and Chief Medical Officer. Are members content? And then we'll return to the other items at a later point. So I refer members to the papers at tab five of the main pack. Can I advise members that the Minister and Chief Medical Officer are here today to update the committee on the work of the department. So I'd like now to welcome Minister Mr. Robin Swan, MLA, Minister for Health, and Dr. Michael McBride, Chief Medical Officer. Minister, could you go ahead and brief the meeting, please? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is definitely social distancing now, Chair. What are we doing here? But anyway, good afternoon as ever, and thank you for the opportunity to update the committee. I'm aware that members will likely raise a number of other issues in their questions. However, in my open remarks today, Chair, I would like to provide a brief update on our rebuilding agenda. It goes without saying not that COVID-19 has wreaked havoc on our community, our way of life and how our health and social care services have been delivered. I have also been clear that things will not be the same again. Not that the previous service was without major system systemic failings anyway, and so we now need to carefully navigate the next phase of dealing with the virus. To that end, I published a, a rebuilding strategic framework on the 9th of June. This recognises that the pace at which progress and rebuilding services can be achieved will also be determined by any future need to review services in the event of further waves of the pandemic or even localised outbreaks occurring. Because of this, planning horizons will remain incremental. However, my department and the trusts are all well aware that where services can be safely resumed and work within the appropriate PPE precautions, I want to see them resumed as quickly as possible. I will now say more about how I will reorganise the rebuilding effort, but before that I feel it is important to again put on record my thanks to our health and social care staff, our nurses, doctors, paramedics, other allied health professionals, pharmacists, care workers, primary care and other frontline health and social care workers who have bravely, bravely and tirelessly put themselves at risk to save the lives of others. I cannot thank all the members of staff enough for that, and I am confident that I can rely upon the continued commitment from all staff as we begin the task of rebuilding health and social care services. It is vital that we put both staff welfare and patients safely at the heart of our efforts to rebuild our service. In terms of the rebuilding work, it is important to recognise the opportunity to mainstream the recent innovations that the primary community and secondary care services have developed over recent months. Our health and social care providers have adopted the, the use of technology like virtual clinics and telephone triage, and we must now build on these experiences, putting innovation, transformation and collaboration at the heart of our approach to rebuilding health and social care services. To that end, I ask the Trust to develop service incremental plans in tandem with the strategic framework. Trusts have already published service plans covering the month of June, and these will help to inform the subsequent incremental plans to develop in three monthly cycles from July onwards. I am aware the draft proposals have now all been published, uh, to the, have been submitted to the Department, and I hope to be in a position to publish the next three-month plans as soon as possible. These plans will, where appropriate, take a, a regional approach and will take into account constraints imposed by COVID-19. Recent service innovations, opportunities associated with the Transformation Programme and digital innovations such as Encompass Programme. Given the complexity and scale of these challenges, it is more important than ever that our health and social care system is given clear direction and that decisions are taken quickly in a fluid and changing environment. The Management Board will report directly to me and will provide oversight and direction of the implementation of my priorities. To that end, for the period of July to September, I have identified the following services as an immediate priority for rebuilding. Cancer, screening, urgent and emergency care, primary care, mental health and social stress, surge planning, acute care at home, care homes and service delivery innovation. 
It is critically important to emphasise that it will not be possible to return to business as usual. Moreover, the rebuilding of services will not happen overnight and will require a response that is both agile and adaptable to ensure the system can respond to further potential COVID-19 surges. But having witnessed the tremendous effort over the last few months, I am convinced that working together we will once again rise to the challenge. Um, thank you, Chair, uh, and I am now happy to take members' questions. Okay, thank you, Minister. Um, well, I suppose first of all, um, we were disappointed, Minister, to receive your reply in relation to the rejecting the proposal that the Allied Health Professionals be represented directly on the new management board. And I'd just like to follow up on some of that. Um, and I suppose before I do that, I would I would like to acknowledge some of the significant positive firsts that we have seen since the last time you were here, including. including uh, no one, no one in ICU on one particular day, no deaths on particular days, and to acknowledge the the, uh, the tremendous effort of all concerned in relation to those figures continuing to uh, appear to be on, on a positive trend. So I'd like to acknowledge that. But we understand the chief medical officer, the chief nursing officer, chief social worker, and the chief pharmaceutical officer will be on the management board, whereas the chief allied health professions officer and chief dental officer will not. Um, and I suppose I did get an opportunity this morning, and again I welcome the announcement this morning of additional training places for allied health professionals. And I do note from, from that document this morning uh, that, that you state each allied health profession makes a significant contribution to delivering on these objectives, and I am delighted to announce this important investment. And given their central role in terms of transformation, Bengoa, their unique specialisms and their unique knowledge, I suppose I would ask what would the difficulty be in including? Those, uh, those two officers, the, the, the Chief Allied Health Professions Officer and the Chief Dental Officer. Uh, no, and, and Chair, you know, I think to start off, thanks for acknowledging you know, the results that we have had in Northern Ireland over the past number of weeks, for the number of days that we've had zero deaths. And I think it is significant that we're now, I think, on day three um, with nobody in ICU due to COVID-19. So that shows the progress that we are making, but it is a fragile progress. And something that we've always cautioned on in regards to, you know, everybody's actions has a role to play in how we manage those numbers, the admissions to hospital, and the number of people who are currently being managed in hospital. In regards to, to the management board and the issues re raised in regards to the chief dental officer and the chief allied health professional, um, those bodies within the departmental structure actually are part of the chief nursing officer's team, so they are both within her her directorate as well. So they answer to her, so she does represent them. At the management board level, she represents them at our, our management group within the department as well. And it's not to say they're excluded, they will be brought on. I've given this reassurance, and even in the response to yourself, I've given the reassurance that they will be included when their input is, is needed, when it is called on um, as necessary within that, that management board. It is, a wide, it is a wide board, and it has input from, from a number of services across that. So it's not they're not excluded, it's, it's they're represented by the chief nursing officer. And we do understand that, and we acknowledge also the significant role that she plays in relation to this, but also the very wide role in terms of representing nursing issues and nursing perspectives, but that there are indeed a lot of other, other uh, perspectives. But how does that decision sit with the Bengoa findings that we need to redirect our focus to primary and community care and to step up the roles of these professions, which are currently somewhat somewhat uh, less less involved, let's put it that way. Well, I, I suppose they're always there to input through the expert panels, Chair, and I think that's one of the, the flexibilities that we had within the management board, was who can provide advice and guidance and how they provide advice and guidance. So we're allied health professionals, and I, and I think from that statement this morning, we have 12 different disciplines across allied health uh, professionals who the chief allied health officer represents. So, as you said, they all come under nursing and under that structure within our management input, so they do input. Um, via that channel. You know, it's a wide board at this moment in time, which includes a lot of representation from primary care um, through the whole way from, our, or as, as I said, the, the, from the trusts represented as well. So again, it's not that they're excluded. They have an input role through the expert panel and through the structure of the chief nursing officer. Okay. And can I also ask, where does the strategic partnership forum sit within these new arrangements? Well, it, it, does, it does sit outside the, the HSC management board, as, as specifically that, Chair. It, it is the management board for, for the new structure going forward. Uh, I meet, I'm due to meet the, the partnership forum um, tomorrow afternoon to engage to make sure we get their input as well, because I think one of the things 
And I think when I presented this model to, to the Assembly, one of the things I wanted to, to reassure members, one of the things that yourself asked, was about that co-production and involvement, which is specified actually through the, the terms of reference of the new management board. So I meet them tomorrow. I met the, the chairs of our, our trusts on arm length bodies a fortnight ago, just to make sure that we are working across, across the entire health and service piece, uh, why we developed this. As you're aware, Chair, these are unusual times. This is a, a rebuilding response to, to a pandemic where we saw our surge plans uh, come into force very, very quickly. And we saw changes within the health service that happened overnight within the number of weeks that we didn't, uh, I suppose we didn't ever imagine was possible, but ever the, the fact that we would need. So it's been taking the steps now to make sure that we can cope um, with re-engaging our services, but also should there be a second surge, because that's always something that we have to be cognizant of if there should be an outbreak or an increase in numbers, that we still have a health and social care service that can cope. Okay. Just to add to that, Madam Chair, I mean, the Chief Dental Officer, I work very closely with within uh, within my my group within the, the department. Indeed, I'm meeting with him uh, on Friday. Uh, he has been instrumental in uh, a significant proportion of the uh, rebuilding uh, plan published on the on the 9th of June around the uh, restoration of uh, normal uh, dental services on a on a phased and incremental approach. Uh, so, as I say, the chief dental officer through through my office and indeed through presentation to the uh, management board as necessary, as minister has said, uh, will provide that leadership, uh, which is so crucially and important. And similarly, the chief allied health professional uh, officer through uh, to through Charlotte McArdle, the chief nursing officer's office. And as I say, we work very very closely as professional colleagues uh, within the within the department. Okay. Thank you for that. And, and actually, that, that does raise the point around, and we heard from, from dentistry last week, but we have heard that uh, there are concerns from dentistry around PPE, support and access to PPE, um, is, uh, and, and safety upgrades. Can you say anything in relation to that issue, Minister? Um, Chair, uh, and again, as the Chief Medical Officer said, I, with the correspondence, and uh, sorry, I sort of met, met with, apologies, uh, the Chief Dental Officer, I think, about a, a week or so yeah. ago, and we have now agreed to issue primary PPE to allow our dental practices to go back to second, no, to, to, to increase to, to the second stage. Um, I, I think if, if my memory serves right, it's PPE that will be issued to the dental profession. And I think the last value that I saw was in the region of £800,000, so we can actually provide that support to get our dental practices up and running again. So we have given that, that guarantee, and the Chief Dental Officer is corresponding with dentists to make them, make them aware of that. Just to add uh, to the Minister, there has been a, a group which has been the British Dental Association were instrumental in uh, providing support to the department in terms of alternative ways of working and designing alternative uh, mechanisms to deliver dental services at, the, uh, at this very start of the, the pandemic, including also uh, many, many uh, community dentists working very differently to support the uh, acute response during uh, surge. Uh, and again, there's a working group which comprised trusts, the BDA, uh, the uh, Chief Dental Officer and Board colleagues in terms of identifying uh, and agreeing that phased return insofar as is practically possible to, to normal service. Uh, much of that in place in terms of it by the end of June in terms of phase one, 29th of June, again towards the end of July and then the second phase of that. It is quite likely, however, that it will be some time yet uh, before aerosolised generating procedures will be carried out routinely uh, in community dental practice because of the risk. Uh, at this present time. Clearly, we'll keep that under review uh, as the levels of community transmission uh, continue to fall, and, and hopefully they will, uh, then the risk to either uh, individual uh, patients attending their dentists or indeed to uh, dentists or dental uh, practice nurses, etc., becomes becomes much less. Okay. Thank you. Um, the RQA have advised us recently of shared characteristics identified in homes where there were outbreaks of COVID-19, and they identified certain risk factors, including larger homes, homes run by larger providers, uh, multiple, multiple homes by the same provider, and cr a crucial one that has come up in a number of instances of homes where there have been more than two managers in the past year. But I'm wondering how the department is responding to those findings. Will there be an extra focus on and support for those homes and how that's linking in with the rapid learning initiative and indeed any update on that initiative that you can give us in terms of lessons learnt at this point? 
I, I don't have any update on the on the, on the rapid learning initiative. That's something that's been led by the chief nursing officer. So it, it, it is a good piece of work, and I think the RQIA issues that you have raised. I think the one that did come as a surprise was the the change of managers within the last last number of years was actually a correlation in regards to outbreak of COVID. So I think the RQIA. Um, I, I was with them last week. Um, we're sort of indicating that that may be an indication of, of possibly a, a, an alert that they can use in regards to general care in, in care homes as well, and as maybe not just related to COVID, but all those indicators are something that, that they're looking at. So it's, it's a wider piece of, of work that the RQI has indicated that we are looking at, uh, I suppose, the trends or where those, where the homes that we are supporting and working with actually are, are there common indicators. Uh, across across those homes, where we, uh, should there be, God forbid, should there be a second surge where we can put uh, additional focus, concentrated focus, in very quickly, because if those are the areas that seem to be at higher risk, that's where we should be act acting first. And I suppose just just to bring you up to date, chair, as well in regards to to our homes, we're currently managing. Um, uh, I, I suppose over the piece with 173 care homes that identified with either, either an outbreak or a suspected outbreak. Um, currently, we've 33 homes um, where we're still managing confirmed outbreaks, uh, 16 with a suspected outbreak, and altogether we've closed um, outbreaks in 124 homes <coughs> across Northern Ireland, and that that number continues to increase. So we are we are showing good progress in the support in regards to closing those outbreaks. Um, in our care homes. If I may just build on that, um, Minister um, Chair, we have um, we've established a UK-wide uh, expert uh, group on care homes uh, to identify some of the rapid learning in terms of some of the uh, uh, factors that you have referred to. Um, it is clear from the emerging research, and I think this is the, it's part of the challenge is, with this is that the evidence is emergent, and what is crucially important that we take that evidence. Uh, as we have with the scientific evidence combined with our own learning in Northern Ireland and translate that very rapidly into the learning uh, work that uh, <clears throat> the Chief Nursing Officer is taking forward and also combine that with the new framework which the Minister announced in terms of enhanced support in terms of multidisciplinary teams, primary care support, secondary care support uh, into uh, care homes. Uh, some of the emerging findings at a UK level are exactly as you have uh, you've indicated. There is a study which uh, we're, will be cited on uh, at a UK level, which shows that the uh, larger care homes, uh, with, i.e. with larger numbers of residents, uh, and also those with increased numbers of staff, um, because obviously they are larger care homes and therefore uh, they will have more staff moving in and out of those care homes, that those uh, seem to be factors. Now, there are other factors as well, um, but those seem to be two of the main factors. Interestingly, the observation that the RQIA has made uh, here in Northern Ireland, as you mentioned, in terms of the stability of the management team, uh, has not been something that has been identified nationally, and we have uh, shared that with UK colleagues, to uh, particularly CQC and uh, the uh, other uh, inspection and regulators within the, the rest of the United. Chair, Chair, maybe just before move, before we move off care homes in regards to to testing, because I know that's something the committee uh, had looked at, and the Commissioner for Older People had. Had raised as well. Um, I'd set a target that I wanted all care homes tested by the end of this month. Now the update this morning, I think, was there's still two homes uh, who are who are left to be tested. Uh, every resident or staff member has been offered testing. Not all have taken it up, as I think we said at the start. You know, to make testing compulsory wouldn't be wouldn't be feasible. So, as we stand as we stand at this morning, we have tested. Um, 12,611 residents, and we're currently supporting 96 um, who have positive tests, and 17,945 staff members, and they're currently supporting 84 staff members who've received positive tests. So that has been a progressive, progressive piece of work that we want. Well, I want it closed by the end of this month, and I think the indications are that we should be able to to achieve that. And will that testing remain ongoing in order to pick up on any further spike or surges? I let the chief medical officer pick up on that. Yeah, we'll, we'll have the uh, testing program completed by uh, today, as minister has indicated. Um, and what we now then need to do, we have a detailed piece of probably 10 days to 14 days analysis to uh, ascertain the relative benefits of that testing program. What I can say is that uh, the uh, positivity rate in those care homes which had not had outbreaks, it's extremely low. 
uh, both in terms of residents and in terms of staff. So we also need to bear in mind that in terms of any retesting programme, that this is an invasive uh, test which is unpleasant, particularly for older individuals and uh, older residents, uh, many of whom uh, may have uh, dementia or may have uh, confusion. So. Uh, the, we, again, we have the, this expert uh, UK group that I mentioned on, on testing, which will be making recommendations to the uh, UK senior clinicians group, which includes uh, the four UK chief nursing officers, the four UK chief medical officers in terms of the um, frequency of retesting. But the minister has already committed uh, to a programme of retesting. Uh, the question remaining is the evidence that would inform the frequency of that and the balance of the benefit versus the fact that it is, at present, an invasive test. Now, hopefully, as time moves on uh, and we get less invasive tests, uh, then that actually be may become less of a consideration. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to go to members. I'm going to go to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron, first of all, and then I'm going to check in with members on the phone, and then I'll come back to the room to a number of members indicating on the phone. Go ahead, Pam. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister, and uh, Dr McBride, for your attendance today. Um, just uh, by way, it's not a question. I'm not going to give up a question, um, but just by way of a statement to say that I, I too am a bit disappointed that, uh, in terms of the new management board, that the allied health professionals and the, the uh, dentistry, uh, to me, should be included. And there's only two people on my head, uh, but I don't, I'm not looking for an answer on that. Um, um, so, in relation to dentists, I've had. Um, uh, actually, a dental patient contacted me to say that their dentist has said they need a, a £50 upfront payment uh, for to cover the cost of PPE before they could um, agree to treat them. And I'm just worried that that could be something going forward. I do welcome uh, that you're, you're working on uh, providing primary PPE of £100,000 worth. I presume that's just like a kickstart to kind of get them going. And I am concerned that. Um, we heard from the dentists and that the the right the, the huge rise in costs six thousand percent they were quoting in, in rising costs of PP and there's also a huge issue around the fit testing and having to pay five six hundred pounds to have a fit testing session, uh, which then is a, a like a rolling program because as they run out of a mask then they have to fit test another one. Um, so is, is there any work ongoing? to, number one, ensure that uh, the dentists are, are getting real um, help that they need to meet these unbearable costs uh, going forward. And also, um, I think, Minister, you mentioned before um, Northern Ireland being self-sufficient, and I think, in, pro in provision of PP. Is there any ongoing work, um, even with not just within health, but within other departments, to ensure that we're doing all we can to uh, ensure that Northern Ireland does become self-sufficient in the, that provision, because obviously if you have a consistent provision, that would also help the rolling cost issue as well. And the other question I want to ask you was in terms of the reopening of health service in general and uh, the mental health and physical damage that is being done uh, to people through non-COVID means. Uh, it's a huge concern of mine. You touched on care homes and uh, Routine, routine testing of uh, people in those settings and, and maybe people with dementia and, and problems. But I'm thinking in terms of visitation for people with dementia and other medical conditions who technology will not help. And maybe the only thing that we know anything to them is to actually bodily be able to see uh, somebody that they love in their life, returning to their life. Is, is there anything coming forward in terms of help and guidance for people, uh, for homes in particular in the care sector to ensure that they can provide some kind of safe visitation. Okay. Um, thanks, Vice Chair. I'll, I'll take, the, I'll take your, your three points maybe in reverse. In regards to visitation, I actually just before coming into this meeting, I, I was talking with our Chief Nursing Officer again, who is leading on the, the visitation guidance across, across the entire sector, should it be care homes uh, or hospital settings as well, and I know maternity uh, visitation is something that's on a high priority at this moment in time. I hope, as I said, a conversation with her just prior to this, I hope to be able to sign off on that. Um, if not this afternoon, first thing and tomorrow, and tomorrow morning, there's a number of, of just technical guidance that, that we're seeking clarity on in regards to, to feedback from trusts, but it is a piece of work that's, that is nearly finished. 
it's something we said is something I actually gave a commitment to executive colleagues that we would have closed out um, actually this week. So it's a piece of work, and, and, and I think, as you indicate, it, it is a big piece of work because it's covering so many, so many different sectors with different risk levels as well. So that's that's been taken into consideration into the guidance that we're given, and also we're looking at when uh, that would be practical because we don't think it's feasible just to be have an immediate start to visits because settings do have to, to put, put put protections and, and steps into place. So we should be in a place if we can uh, either this afternoon or first thing tomorrow that should be made public and I'll make sure it's shared um, with the committee as soon as I, I sign off on it. Um, in regards to becoming self-sufficient in PPE, I think one of the things that the last three, three and a half months has shown was how our department and the Department of Finance worked, especially in procurement and advancing the, the purchase of PPE, not just for ourselves, but also for other departments for justice uh, and uh, you know, for infrastructure and a number of different avenues. There is an e-tender out at this minute in time um, for PPE. Um, manufacturing and I actually brought it to, to my attention the day before yesterday that we as a, a department could be doing more to promote it within Northern Ireland so I've asked, I've asked departmental officials to, to look to see how we can actually publish that but I noticed that some of the trusts are actually promoting that e-tender process to make sure that as many Northern Ireland companies are fully aware that that, that tendering process is now open and is available for, for Northern Ireland companies to apply into in regards to a £50 up front payment for, for dentists. Um, I, am, I, I assume that's a private um, dental profession, uh, a professional, rather than one within the NHS, because we wouldn't be asking for that if it was an NHS dentist. There wouldn't be that sort, that sort of ask. But the PPE that we're supplying is to allow dentists to get to the next stage of, of opening up for, for, for treatment. It'll not, as the, as the Chief Medical Officer said, it's not going to the full final stage three for the APG procedures. It allows them to do more routine, more routine practice and get our dentists open again. Because one of the things that, that we have to be cognizant of is, is also the additional service that dentists supply. Should it be even in the early identification of oral cancers and other things? So it's not just it's just not solely about looking at teeth and putting in films. Our dentists do provide provide additional value. Yeah, and just to, to add to that briefly, I mean, the, the impact in terms of industry has been profound. Do you think that prior to, to pandemic? You know, 50,000 people attended their dentist on an average week. That's down to 2,000 uh, at present. Uh, so that's a very significant impact, and it's important for all of the, minutes, the, the issues Minister has mentioned in terms of uh, dental treatment and care. And I'm really indebted uh, to all of those dentists and other staff who've volunteered to, to work in the uh, specialist and urgent treatment centres across all our trust. Areas, you know, seeing through somewhere in the region of 250 uh, individual patients a week who required aerosolized generating uh, procedures. Uh, certainly happy to pick up the specific point you mentioned in my uh, discussions with the Chief Dental Officer uh, on, on Friday. Um, in relation to the uh, issue around PPE and repurposing, um, just to say that we have been working very closely. Uh, and with other departments and including with Invest in I to engage with local businesses in terms of, of uh, repurposing uh, to meet the specific needs uh, in relation to Northern Ireland and indeed one of the learning points I think from the pandemic has been the challenges with very very long supply lane, uh, lines which have, have developed over recent years and there's a number of of uh, companies, local companies, which uh, you'll be aware of, um, certainly we provide the details that have so uh, repurposed. And the final comment I wanted to make was in relation to the visiting. I think I'm also profoundly concerned about the impact that it's had on residents and care homes and indeed other facilities, other supported living environments, whether it's individuals with learning disability, been separated now for some 12 weeks, uh, who have not been able to interact with their family in the same way uh, that they normally would. Uh, we know that, that for in care homes, many of those individuals are in the last year or two of life. Um, it's crucially important that they meet their families, and I know some care homes have facilitated outdoor meetings, etc., to minimise the risk with appropriate social distancing. Um, I think it's also important that we recognise not meeting someone um, who uh, may subsequently uh, die uh, has the risk of prolonged grief reaction for relatives as well. So those are issues that we're acutely aware of, and it's about balancing the benefit to the individual 
versus the risk to the individual who's maybe quite vulnerable, other residents, staff, but also uh, the risk to the visitor. But I'm confident now with the decrease in community transmission and with the, the excellent work of the Chief Nursing Officer along with colleagues that we will be able to safely manage uh, those risks and allow people quite rightly and support them to, to visit relatives. I do appreciate that. And just on the back, Minister, of your comment around the, um, the tenders and, and making sure that Northern Ireland companies are made well aware of that. Uh, it has been raised with me as well, the issue around um, the criteria for the tenders and issues in regard to costs and pricing and how far up. That's another consideration I would suggest you need to take into account because uh, obviously a Northern Ireland company may well not be able to compete with the price of, of some PP coming from China, for example. And I think if we want to ensure that we have that steady, constant supply going forward, um, that, that would be another issue I would suggest that the Department need to look at. Fair point. Yeah, and, and just actually on the back of that, uh, and declaring an interest as having for many years been involved in a small business, can I say they often struggle just to engage with the tendering process. And if departments like yourselves are keen to get people to get involved, I would suggest a bit of workshopping to advise them what it is you need, what the, you know, something along that line may help to remove some of the other barriers to small business to engage in. Because I also think it's important that we establish a homegrown industry yep. for 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 the shortage of this pandemic potentially, but also for future pandemics or epidemics of any sort. So I think that's something worth maybe considering. Um, going on now then to the telephone, I'm just checking in with Colin, who I think is the only member we have so far on the phone. Colin, are you there? Uh, yes, indeed, thank you. And I know there are others on the phone as well, but thank you for coming to the first because of the questions in the chamber at 2 o'clock. Um, I have just two issues to raise with the um, Minister. Um, the first is the Down Hospital and the return to uh, normal service filling the emergency department. I just want to be able to get a big the decision for the treatment or is it the decision? Colin, okay. sorry, Colin, uh, can I interrupt you there? You're breaking up quite badly, Colin. I wonder if there's anything you're doing there or anything you can do to try to improve your quality of sound. You're breaking up here in the room. It's clear enough, but you're breaking up quite badly, if you know what I mean. Is that any better at the moment, sir? That seems better now. Yes, try that, Colin. Okay, so I was just um, discussing the issue of the Down Hospital and asking about the um, decision-making about the reopening of the emergency department and return of services there. Is that a decision that the trust are left independently to take, or is that a decision that is taken in conjunction with the department in any shape? Because I just want to know on the record exactly who it is that's responsible for the decision to reopen those services again. Um, Colin, it is part of our restructuring plan that uh, you know we're looking at, at restructuring regionally in regards to the Down Hospital specifically and, and its ED I think you've had engagement with with the Chief Executive of Southern Southeastern Southeastern uh, uh, recently in, in regards to that and you know I, I haven't had sight of their next three monthly review the, the the July to September one but I know it is a commitment that he has given a number of, of various political reps that the ED will be returning it's a matter of when not if uh, well thank the minister for that I'm glad that you know that I've had contact because I haven't had any response to it and he's had that for um, at least a week at this stage, so I'm glad that there's an acknowledgement that he has that. Um, in terms of the um, issues regarding um, baby scans uh, dur during pregnancy, um, a number of people are feeling very worried, very concerned, um, because they're being left to attend these on their own and for expectant mothers. And it obviously can be quite a frightening time with scans being taken and images and people wearing PPE, etc. Does the maybe chief medical officer have any encouragement that the, that decision might change soon to allow um, people, uh, you know, for um, expecting mothers to have their partners with them to enable them to be able to uh, join them at those scans? Yeah, I, I call, I'm not sure if you heard the, or the response to, to the vice chair in regards to the visit, and maybe I should have made it, made it clear as well that also included that will be uh, allowing partners 
or a family member to attend uh, an expectant mother, should it be from scans, um, through labour to delivery. So that is actually being encapsulated and included in the work that the chief nursing officer is doing. So as soon as, as I said earlier, you know, as soon as that is is signed off, there was just a few technicalities that I want to clear up. So it should be cleared. Up, it should be signed off this afternoon or tomorrow, and that will give give guidance for for those individuals as well, because we are. Fully, fully aware of, of the concerns and the support that is necessary, uh, you know, especially during initial scans or should a scan identify um, uh, you know, a fetal abnormality where, where there's multiple scans that, that have to be, be followed up on, where the, the support of a partner is greatly valued and it's something that we, we want to get re-established as soon as we can. I don't know, Michael, if you want to... No, I mean, I think that's, that's you know, I think we all, uh, most of us will have the experience as, as fathers, uh, how important it is to, to be there and be present for those scans, so at a very personal level, but also at a professional level. I, I think it, I've, uh, you know, and I've heard at, at first hand some of the experiences and concerns that you've expressed. Um, I think that those decisions were made for good reason. Uh, we know that uh, certainly in the latter stages of, of pregnancy in particular, women uh, can be at, at some increased risk. Uh, because of the complications associated with COVID-19. So all of the decisions were uh, taken to, to protect uh, women who were pregnant um, and indeed uh, partners. Um, but clearly, you know, now that community transmission has, has fallen, it is appropriate uh, that we uh, put in place measures to facilitate and support uh, partners attending uh, such visits. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Chair, I've been literally contacted by dozens of expectant mothers and indeed fathers as well, and I know that that will come as very welcome news. And I thank the Minister and Chief Medical Officer for that intervention. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Before I go to Alex, I'm just checking: Have we anyone else on the phone line at the present time? Okay, we'll listen in there to hear if we can hear anyone coming on. Alex. Yeah, thank you for your presentation and um, keep up the good work. And um, thank you for your note. I really appreciate that. Um, the service increase, I get the logic, and I don't disagree, but obviously I worry about other services. So could I sort of ask you, um, I know you've already said it, it's going to be reopened at some stage, the bank or minor injuries. Will that be getting opened as part of this? And also, can you maybe fill us in in terms of what's happening with GP surgeries? Are we going to be able to get them up and running uh, to get the patients in there? Um, also, I want to know what the R rate is at the moment, because I haven't seen one in a wee while. Yeah. And um, the other question is, have we got lucky in terms of the incidents several weeks ago of the gatherings on the beaches and funerals, because there doesn't seem to have been an effect on the COVID-19 uh, potential increase. Have we managed to just be lucky in that? Um, luck in medical science. I don't know where the chief medical officer will go with. Uh, I, I think we have been fortunate that we didn't see an increased number of outbreaks, especially down around, around Ballyhome Beach and where we were at that point in time in regards to community transmission to where we are now. So I think we have been fortunate. I know there was an increased number in, I think, the, the Arch North Down Council area that we did see. Um, we did see an increased number of positive tests. Now, they weren't linked um, as a as community cluster or an outbreak. So whether they're connected to those, those public gatherings, we, we don't have that intelligence at this minute in time, so it, it's something that the PHA does there's a lot of intelligence and a lot of, lot of work on in regards to the contact tracing piece. In regards to R, and the Chief Medical Officer will keep me right, we, we publish R on a Thursday yeah. after it's presented to the Executive Meeting. I think the last publication is 0.6 yeah. to 0.9, um, so that's where we sit and that would be comparative um, across a number of the regions of, of the United Kingdom. In regards to, to GPs, I think you know, even in my, my earlier statements, in regards to what some GPs are indicating, that the move to you know, telephone triage, online triage, um, is actually helping them with their workload and seeing more patients and getting a, uh, you know, a, a better turnover of, of clients. But there's nothing um, that, that overtakes or, or supersedes the face-to-face -face engagement uh, with a client or with a patient. Uh, when they actually need it, so it's about encouraging, as we see the, the decrease in community transmission, is about GPs opening more uh, to the walk-in appointments that are the, the, the pre, 
pre-arranged appointments they had in the past, but that's you know, GP practices are, are managing that. In regards to the Bangor Mind Energies Unit, Alex, I, I don't have that detail, but it will be in the, uh, uh, if it's not in the third or the, or the, the next three month stage, you know, I think it's something the, the Chief Executive of, of the Local Trust will be able to advise on. Michael, do you want to? Yeah, just very briefly to add to that. I mean, I think that um, I'm not a believer in luck. I think we, we make our own luck. I mean, I think I've said for quite some time this virus doesn't spread itself, we spread it. Uh, the decisions that we take, the, the actions uh, that we uh, take um, over the next number of weeks and months will determine whether we can keep this virus in check or not. Uh, so it is crucially important uh, that complacency doesn't creep in, that we adhere, all of us, uh, to the message around social distancing uh, and good hand and respiratory hygiene. That's absolutely crucially important. And including uh, when uh, we're in situations where we cannot socially distance, whether that's on public transport uh, or whether that's in, uh, in retail areas, that we keep to the strong recommendation of the uh, executive to wear uh, face uh, coverings. Um, so this is within our gift. Uh, this has been hard earned. You know, sadly, a lot of lives have been lost, and many lives have been adversely impacted upon, and many livelihoods have been uh, sadly affected. So, you know, this has been hard earned, and therefore it's crucially important that we continue uh, to follow the advice. In terms of our, um, <coughs> I think just only thing to add to the, the minister's comments, our will be increasingly less important in terms of an estimate of how active the virus is, because obviously as the number of cases fall, the number of admissions to hospital, and we're, you know, that's at very low levels now, but the number of admissions to ICU, for instance, are becomes um, less uh, reliable, and the confidence intervals widen, so the confidence inter intervals will approach one just, it's a mathematical uh, uh, phenomenon in terms of just uh, its ability to estimate accurately uh, uh, decreases. And what will become increasingly important thereafter uh, is the number of new cases uh, that we're seeing. So that is very much dependent on us having uh, robust processes around testing, encouraging everyone who has symptoms uh, to get a test, uh, to ensure that our contact test tracing pro, uh, process test uh, trace uh, protect is working effectively and good evidence uh, that that is the case. That will be crucially important in the next phase. That said, uh, there is no doubt that we will see uh, localised clusters and we will see outbreaks. I mean, that has been the uh, pattern in other parts of this island um, we, and indeed other parts of the, uh, of the United Kingdom. And we have seen some very high profile uh, media reports of localised outbreaks over the last number of weeks and days. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, go on now to Jerry. Uh, thanks, thanks, Fred. Uh, Chair, um, Minister, a number of people have been in touch with me about being unable to get operations or having difficulty uh, getting appointments, specifically people with different cancer um, uh, issues. And there's also a problem around visits we've heard, um, obviously previously, uh, and of uh, one particular constituent whose brother um, has had a stroke, uh, but she can't see him. Uh, she's a healthcare worker herself. She understands the need for distancing and PPE, etc. Uh, I think the Minister, you said, or you indicated, uh, guidance is going to be uh, issued on that um, soon around appointments and, and visits, so I'll just uh, convey that to you. Uh, I think there's a lot of people who want to see their loved ones, but are willing to adhere to uh, guidance uh, and distancing, etc. Uh, in regards to the RQIA, um, for the first 40 days since the CMO uh, issued their action, um, on the 20th of March to reduce inspections, the RKIA didn't carry a single uh, inspection um, on site at nursing homes. It's very, very concerning, and you only wonder what might have been uh, uncovered and revealed if it had been allowed. It's also my understanding that the RKIA Chief Executive uh, told the Minister on the 26th of April and the 3rd of May that the Chief Medical Officer's position was untenable, and the Minister confirmed whether that was true. Um, and if it was the case, um, was it not? For the committee to to understand that and, and be told that, and as a minister himself, I think that the CMO position uh, is tenable. Um, during the pandemic, we've also had um, a lot of issues um, repeatedly raised about uh, Romwood Homes scandal around Clifton, and there have been red flags raised uh, in the past, uh, especially around um, Romwood generally, but also Clifton uh, in particular. And it was previously said, maybe yourself, minister or the CMO. 
that we don't have any powers to investigate a, a service provider uh, like Romwood Homes um, mm -hmm. repeatedly fail to meet standards. Um, uh, there's just been so many cases, but my understanding of it is that under the 2003 order, and there's powers to investigate service providers like Romwood Homes uh, who fail to meet uh, standards, and these powers have been in place since, since 2003. Um. I thank the member for his points. In regards to, to the operations in, res in response to specific counters, one of the indications is said under the next the next phase model is as a, a, a focus on cancers and cancer treatments back up and running and as soon as possible because it's one of the areas that we do need to to get back on top of. In regards to the visits, um, if there there is uh, specific special circumstances where visits. Can be facilitated depending on the hospital, and depending should the individual maybe be approaching you know, the end of life or, or in palliative care, so that can be facilitated even before the, before the announcement is made. In regards to the chief executive of RQIA informing me on two specific dates that the chief medical officer's position was untenable, no, absolutely not, Jerry. Um, I don't know where you've got that information. I, it's, it's not something that. I'm aware of, nor is, is it something that I, I would be even alert to. Uh, your question, do, you, do you, I think the Chief Medical Office position is tenable? Of course I do. I have every confidence in the advice that he, he provides to me, he provides to the executive on the guidance and the leadership that he gives within their department. When you look at where we are in Northern Ireland, and it's not something that I've ever done in regards to the comparators um, across the nation, the, the four home nations or, or the Republic of Ireland, where you look at the position that Northern Ireland is, um, we're in a far better place than a lot of other areas, and it's due to the leadership and the commitment of our Chief Medical Officer, our Chief Scientific Advisor, and the advice and guidance that they have been providing, not just to me as Health Minister, but also to the Executive as a whole. Because one thing that our First Minister and Deputy First Minister have always been clear is that they have been guided over the past 14 weeks by the science. And that science and that advice and that guidance has come from our Chief Scientific Advisor and our Chief Medical Officer. So for him to question that, that integrity or that credibility, it's not in the place that, that, I, that, that I will be, uh, because I have confidence in the work that Michael has, has provided and in the, in the leadership and the guidance that he has, he has given me. In regards to, to the, the, the challenges of Runwood uh, or any other home as a corporate group, it's, it was in regards to the inspection procedures and, and the follow-up inspection. And I'll have a look at the 2003 order um, to see if there's anything there that we could use or can use. It's not something that I'm aware of at this moment in time, and that's why in any, any uh, previous updates where I've talked about my desire to change how we do uh, regulation on inspection, um, that it's something that I want to see brought about where a corporate provider can be inspected a corporate provider rather than just looking at an ind individual uh, facility. In regards also to the number of RQIA inspections, um, since uh, they were scaled back, and I want to be clear, they were scaled back, they weren't stopped, um, there have been a number of RQIA inspections taking place. And I think what would maybe be useful at some point of time if we got a comparator as to the number of inspections that RQIA completed in Northern Ireland in comparison to their sister organisations um, in the other jurisdictions, because I think we will find out that RQIA actually were um, operating under very difficult circumstances and were completing um, a number of inspections um, above maybe any of their other counterparts. Thank you. Uh, going across then to Paula. Thank you. Thank you, um, Minister and Chief Medical Officer. I'm, I'm going to continue this vein around the RQIA, um, Minister. I have been um, contacted like this sort of correspondence, tweets, messages, text messages, emails, very concerned about what's been going on between your department and RQA in, in recent months. I was then, obviously, then that's combined by the fact that, um, first of all, you didn't tell the chamber that you were uh, launching the investigation before announcing it to the media. You'd clearly appointed somebody by that point. So what I want to know is, who wrote the terms of reference for this investigation? How was Mr Nicholl, and I have no issue with him uh, at all, how was he appointed? What criteria was used? And who made that appointment? Because we need to be sure that whistleblowers like the who ever sent this to me and all the information that um, we probably as committee members have, have been sent, that that is going to feed into that investigation. Because a lot of it rings true to me when I sort of piece it together, a lot of it rings true to me. And I'm very concerned that because your investigation was pulled together so quickly, um, that we will never probably get to the bottom of actually what happened in terms of mass resignation from 
RTAA board. Um, I, I think, um, Paula, in, in regards to your, your, your comments in regards to sequencing, I think it was actually something that was raised um, in the chamber that day um, in regards to me announcing the, the, the review um, to the media prior to the chamber. I was due to sequencing. I was doing the, the two o'clock. I was doing the Tuesday media brief on behalf of the executive, as I always do. Um, I was due to speak in the chamber then after that, so it was actually in the media before I was in the chamber, and I think, the, as I said, in the chamber that day, the issue had been raised by a number of members who were in the chamber, who were also in that room, had been raised in the media that morning. Um, so I suspected it was going to be something that was going to be raised by the journalists. So I answered it in the media. I then apologised to the House uh, in regards to it being announced in the media before it was announced in the chamber. It was an issue that Jim Allister and I actually raised, and I assured him that there was no discourtesy meant. <coughs> it was purely a matter of, of sequencing. In regards to the appointment of, of Mr Nicola or onboard training, I'm glad you, you know, you, that you do recognise that he is a professional that is widely recognised in regards to uh, the training, the advice, the guidance that he gives to voluntary boards. Um, he has carried out similar pieces of work um, in the past. Um, if you're criticising for me for acting swiftly, I, I, I don't accept it. I, I think I wanted to move quickly, I wanted to move decisively to get this piece of work started, because I would say if we were in the other position, whereas at this moment in time I actually hadn't started a review, um, I would be equally criticised having, having not started a review as in actually having started one. So I'd rather be, cr be criticised for, for moving decisively and quickly. Um, the terms of reference have been drafted by uh, the, my permanent secretary. They have been cleared with me. They have been cleared by me. And I want to make sure that they not only go into uh, the work of the previous board and their engagements with the department, because it's something I want to make sure that any engagement that um, any of our arms link bodies board have in regards to the department are fully functional, because what has to be remembered is though those boards are appointed by me, those boards are my eyes and ears within those arms length bodies. They are my representative. They are not there as an independent management structure. They are there to uh, deliver the, the, the minister's direction and the minister's will. That is what a board's, board's function is. Um, so, in regards to the correspondence, I have I, asked and I have asked um, had a good conversation with David. I have told him he is fully independent. He has access to whatever information he needs and he will receive it. So, it is not about the speed. Um, I will take that criticism. I want to move to, uh, because I want to learn from what the problems were within the board and I want to clarify, or the previous board, I want to clarify if their concern was in regards to the direction that was given or what it seems to be is that they didn't think they were consulted on the direction that was given. And we have to put things into perspective that that decision was made um, you know, at a time where we were seeing uh, an increase in the number of deaths, positive cases. So it's always, it's always valuable. Uh, to put any decision that's made or any guidance that's given into the perspective of where we were over the past 14 weeks. Well, I would just pick up on the point you said there about problems within the board. I would suggest that this, the remit of this investigation should also be some problems within senior levels of your department, Minister. I will move on to the next question. and It really does relate. You mentioned there the Permanent Secretary. I am concerned that you, uh, in the um, memorandum that your department issued to us, um, uh, referencing this temporary amendment to the Health and Social Care Act 2009, so a legislative change, albeit temporary, around removing the 12-week consultation process to allow your new management board to be agile in terms of changes. Given that some of the work that they will be doing will be transformational, and given that um, we are now through the far side of the pandemic pretty much, would it not be better that because and I share the concerns of other members that it's such a tight cabal at this management board, that you would keep in, in place a consultation process that would allow stakeholders to scrutinise and feed in to any proposed changes that are coming forward when you reset your health and social care sector? Um, I'll take exception with the word tight cabal. Um, My words. I, yeah, that's your words. It's your interpretation of a, of a group, a large group of highly professional people who have the health and well-being of the people of Northern Ireland at their centre. It takes into consideration some, some GPs or chief medical officer or chief nursing officer. So I, I don't want them described as a, a cabal or in some sort of perception that they're actually uh, there to do down um, the work of, of the Health and Social Care Trust, because I don't think that's fair. 
Um, they, they are an agile board. They have the ability to bring in experts and expert advisory panels um, as well for specific pieces of work. So we, we could stall what we're doing now. Um, if we stall what we do now, we return to a health service that we had uh, at the beginning of January. We, we return to a health service where we had waiting lists that were way above and beyond anywhere across Western Europe. We were a, a, a place where our waiting times in our emergency uh, departments were excessive. We're overreaching 12 hours. So what we are doing now is using the ability to look, look at the services that we do provide, but also, and, and I think in your phraseology, and it's something we have to be be careful of when you say you know, we're through the other side of this pandemic. We're not. This pandemic is still there. This virus is still in Northern Ireland. This virus is still across the United Kingdom. Where you look to where we are, or where, or even where America is at this minute in time. You now, some of the highly advanced medical services in the Western world who are struggling to cope with this. So we're not through the pandemic. I have to ensure that we have a health service that gets back to doing what we were doing pre-COVID, but also is agile enough to support the people of Northern Ireland should we go into a second spike. And that's a hard service to deliver, because the service that we had prior to COVID was already on its knees. It was one that had been underfunded. It was one that seen our healthcare workers and our nurses on strike lines for the first time in, what, 70 to 100 years of the service, and 72 years of the anniversary of the NHS, for the first time ever in Northern Ireland. So, so this, this perception that our health service wasn't a good place prior to COVID, and it's it is only because of COVID that's in the situation is now, is something that I think we have to challenge. So we're doing our best with a, a service that has been underfunded over the number of years, with a health workforce that is struggling uh, because of the capacity and the numbers within it. One of the great achievements that we claim from New Decade, New Approach, was 900 eggs in nursing places. When we put that into perspective as to where we are now, that's not a massive increase. It's a standstill position to re to replace some of the vacancies that we had. If those 900 nurses had been in place a number of years ago, we wouldn't have had a service as it is. So it's about not, not stopping, and it's about the engagement that we have. We have the expert panels there, the consultation process, the engagement is there. As I said, I'm meeting the partnership forum to, tomorrow afternoon. I've met with our trust chief executives, our, our arms length bodies chief executive for the Royal Colleges to make sure that they are supportive. And I think what you'll find across the medical profession is a degree of engagement uh, with this transformation, with some of the changes that been, are being made, uh, that they're welcoming it because they realise it's what is needed to be done. And when you look at some of the, the recommend, recommendations and some of the changes that are coming, it's something that's been talked about from Bangoa, it's something that's been um, in many further and many previous um, iterations of changes to the health service in Northern Ireland that has never come about. So it's about using this time to actually deliver a health service in Northern Ireland that can support the people. Minister, you didn't actually just one very quick point. You, you, you didn't actually answer the question. I, I found out that you, your permanent secretary, was proposing to take away this um, temporarily this requirement for the twelve-week consultation. We, as a health committee, should not be hearing this from third parties. If this is a regulatory. Um, change that's been proposed in legislation here, that we should be briefed by your departmental officials. So the, the 12, the 12, and the set aside of the 12, 12 weeks was in the initial announcement. I, I, I'll, I'll check we that. Haven't, we haven't been brought, we, the, the specifics uh, haven't been brought to this committee so that we can scrutinise and engage okay, no, around it. So I'll check. That. Sorry, thank you, Chair. Okay, if you're leaving that. Can I just comment, Chair, Chair Barry, believe it, I just appeal to this committee not to send out a message that this pand we are through the worst of this pandemic. We are at the but to the end of the beginning of this, as back to the questions that were, uh, I responded to earlier, we we cannot return to the health service we were providing in January. It is not that. possible with the risk that we have. Uh, we will only be able to meet and provide cancer services, re-establish screening services, re-establish GP services if we build in the innovation that we had to put in place to keep uh, patients, the public and staff safe. It is not possible to wind the clock back and say, well, let's reset as January, uh, because the risk to the public uh, through crowding, absence of social distancing, etc., in terms of how we used to provide services, will just not be sufficient. So, you know, we really do need to take and continue to take extraordinary measures and steps if we are to return to any resemblance of uh, 
service uh, for the population uh, in Northern Ireland. No problem. Yeah, and, and, and I think the committee would take on board the fact that lessons that are learned or new ways of doing things that add value should certainly be content, could, considered. However, we would also want to see that that, that co-production and the sure. rebuilding of services takes into account a wide range of views, including including public and sector and, and all of that. Um, Alan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I certainly am pleased that the um, uh, Minister of Health and the Chief Medical Officer have actually addressed Paula's statement there that we are through the pandemic. I, I think that would be quite a dangerous view uh, to come out of this committee. It certainly is, is not, it has not gone away, that's for sure. Um, in terms of the relaxations, Minister, that the Executive have been, meet, uh, been making, I realise that they, they come with risks and uh, they are big calls that uh, the Executive have to make. And a lot is based around the, the, the R number. Um, should the, the, the fact that we have made uh, some quite significant relaxations over recent days, and, and there's more to come uh, in the days ahead, is there a, a possibility that, in fact, we may have to actually claw back some of the established relaxations that we've already put in place? Uh, or will it slow up or, or even prevent um, some of the relaxations that have been planned and that have been announced? Um, in terms of testing in the nursing homes, I congratulate you for the, uh, the, the, the sheer numbers that uh, you managed to get through. It's been a, a huge job and I think that it does put into perspective the call from some professionals that um, residents and staff should be tested twice a week. Uh, in the nursing home settings, I think the fact that it's taken three or week, three or four weeks to, to, to get through this mammoth task uh, does put that into perspective. In terms of the North Down situation, Alec alluded to it earlier there, about we had six or seven cases in, in North Down at, at a week when maybe it was the figure was zero in other council areas. Um, the, uh, I, I certainly spoke to the... the um, the health authority, public health authority, about it, and uh, they weren't overly concerned about it, and assured me that there wasn't a certainly wasn't a cluster. It is a cluster more significant than just individual outbreaks, say over a huge area? If you get six or seven spread over a huge area, is that not as significant as what a, a does a cluster provide a bigger threat to the public? Okay. Um uh, thanks, Alan. In regards to the regulations and the changes that we make, I think one of the things that um, the executive was criticised for at the very beginning was not putting a specific date timeline um, on issues. And I think, um, personally, I think we've been vindicated in doing that because we've been making changes at the right time. The time that's right when we look to where we are in regards to community transmission, the number of people in the hospital, so that we have an agility that I think other people don't have who actually set those, those timelines. So when the executive makes recommendations to, to change regulations, we have been doing it in a very incremental and, and managed process. There are those changes that are made on specific dates, but there's also those changes that are proposed to be made on specific dates. So it gives us always that 10 day lag in between um, the first and deputy first minister announcing a proposed change, where the chief medical officer, chief scientific advisor, can, can uh, make an assessment on where we are in regards to R or the number of missions or community transmission, so that those decisions are always guided and advised by by the medical and scientific advice that comes from our chief medical officer and, and chief scientific advisor, so that we are doing those things in, in a step process. At some point, may we be in a position where we have to claw back and, and pull back? Yeah. You know, if the general public uh, and we do see an increase in community transmission, we do see a spike or a second wave coming. One of the things that the only things that we are able to do is start to pull back those restrictions uh, and regulations that we we have changed. So again, come back to the chief medical officer point. When it comes to social distancing, when it comes to hand hygiene, when it comes to wearing face coverings, those things are all important because they do have an impact. And at the early beginning, what I always said was. Um, you know, your actions today would have an effect on where we were in two weeks' time. That's still relevant. So if people being responsible now in regards to, to how COVID has spread does have an effect on the progressions and the changes in regulations that um, that, that the executive can, can make in a whole. Um, in regards to, to the care home testing, yes, it was a mammoth task, but it was one that I think we needed to do 
in regards to find out um, where we were in regards to prevalence within the care homes, but also to provide a reassurance um, to the sector, uh, to residents and to families as well. So that was an, an, important, an important piece of work that, that we did and has, has completed uh, and has been completed. Uh, and I think you recognise the amount of work that it has, ha, has taken to do that. It involved Northern Ireland Ambulance Service, it involved our trusts, it involved the mobile testing units that are part of the national testing programme. So it was, it was a, a large scale operation. In regards to clusters and, and groups, and I think the Chief Medical Officer covered this earlier, it's something that we do need to be fully aware of because no matter how well um, the general public behave, no matter what we do, um, we are expecting at some point to see clusters uh, within within Northern Ireland, should they be community-based, should they be workplace-based. It, it's inevitable uh, with this virus, and we've seen it elsewhere, we've seen it in other countries across the world. So it's something, especially with our track and trace uh, system in place being operated by the Public Health Agency, that we'll be able to manage, uh, monitor and then support the individuals as well. Because that's one of the things that we do need to, and it's working across the executive, uh, that when we do contact someone and ask them to self-isolate, we need to make sure there's a support package um, in place that encourages them to follow that advice. Because if they're going to do it at the detriment of either to income or personal welfare, you know they're, they're not going to do that. So we need to again, it's a whole executive uh, approach. Yeah, no, just in terms of the uh, outbreaks, uh, I think that um, there are two things we're looking for now, and that will be any further sense that we're seeing the development of a second wave of or waves of uh, uh, COVID-19 over the uh, months ahead. The second thing is uh, to rapidly identify uh, clusters. Now, obviously, clusters can be of a variety of, of scale and size. The, the difference between a cluster and an outbreak is really one of numbers. Clusters can be quite small. They can be sort of family groups or groupings. Uh, outbreaks tend to be more uh, larger numbers of people uh, affected, uh, and that can be either uh, geographically located, so over geographical area, we've seen that in, in Leicester, for instance, or it could be related to a particular environment, it could be a work environment, and we've seen uh, outbreaks, for instance, in a number of meat plants uh, across the UK, the Republic of Ireland, the US, and indeed we have similar outbreaks in, in Wales. So those are areas that, uh, whenever we're, our testing programme and our contact testing programme, whenever uh, we get positive results, the information that we seek uh, from individuals, really, really important, and join, joining that up in terms of identifying any trends that might be emerging. To date, uh, we have not had uh, significant outbreaks. Uh, they will come, I have no doubt about that, and we just need to be ready uh, for when that happens. Excuse me, Mr Chairman. OK, thank you, Alan. Chair, um, could I come in the back of Alan's question? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Pam. Um, a welcome just, Pam, before I do, I want to check the phones. Do we have anyone else on the phone there at the present time? No, I don't think so. Um, thank you, for, um, uh, Michael, for confirming that we're not out of this pandemic. And uh, I wanted to ask the Minister specifically on the back of Alan's question around community transmission. Minister, are you worried um, on the back of um, evidence seen today from large funerals being held um, in Belfast and members of this House attending those funerals? and? I'm looking at pictures. I don't see social distancing. I don't see masks. Um, I'm seeing large crowds spectating very close together. And I am very concerned that, that we will lose any um, type of compliance from the public on the back of these types of incidents. Have you any comments? Or, or are you concerned about com uh, compliance going forward? I, I have um, concerns in regards to a breakdown or people failing to observe the guidance um, that the executive has given collectively over the past 14 weeks, because one of the things um, that has worked for Northern Ireland is our executive uh, standing together, giving a consistent message that the people of Northern Ireland have followed, because some of the measures that we asked them to undertake were draconian, we said that from the beginning, but the people of Northern Ireland followed the advice and guidance and that's why we are where we are today. Um, my concern is that if there's anything that undermines the general public's confidence in the guidance that's coming out from the executive, from the members of this, this health committee, 
who have been beneficial and supportive um, over, the, over the pandemic. Um, anything that undermines that confidence and the advice and guidance that does concern me. Because one of the things that I have to be cognizant of as Health Minister is to ensure that our health service can cope with any future spike or outbreak. So what I would say to people is the advice, the guidance is there for a reason. I've said it before. There's no person, there's no point of privilege that puts anyone above the advice and guidance that this executive, this assembly and our medical professionals have given us how we manage this, this COVID-19. So what I'll ask, um, I think, members of the general public to do is look to, look to your own conscience, follow what is best uh, for your family, um, for your loved ones, and to make sure that you adhere to the advice and guidance that is coming out from the executive and from the Department of Health, because it's there to save lives. Thank you, Minister. Um, can I also ask you, Minister, in relation to the contaminated blood? And I know, and I, I know you have written to us, and you've advised that, that you're in, currently involved in phase two of a review of that matter. But can you advise on the timeline for payments from this year's budget for persons affected by contaminated blood? Um, I can't give a, a specific date, Chair. But what I will say is, we are, in, uh, we have brought our, our officials over again back into the contaminated blood work stream. Um, they were working on our regulations uh, in regards to COVID. Um, there was a meeting yesterday afternoon in regards to our next steps and how we process them. One of the things that I want to assure those people, and I, I've met them um, like yourself, Chair, I want to give those people a reassurance that their best interests are my interests as well. There are a group of people who have been failed uh, in the past. I've said to them clearly that my support is there for them. I will not fail them, and I'll make sure that they get the support that they need and they deserve. So, as, as an, again, Chair, um, I, I don't want to add any further distress to those individuals. It's a matter of time, and um, I'm, I'm happy enough to engage with them again because I want to get, progress this piece of work um, uh, as quickly as possible. We, we were um, we were given the money again from the Department of Finance. It wasn't a recurrent budget, but we have it for this year, so it's moving. And that. what we were able to do last year as well was actually to supply. Um, Trying to think of the right word, we were able to give a, a, a small payment to those uh, widows and widows who were, who were bereaved, Chair, as well. It's something that, as Minister, I would like to see if we can do again as a part of a fuller support package. So it's not about detracting from those we have seen in the past, but it's actually making sure how we can provide a more holistic support for those individuals as well, because there was there was psychological support that was also in place at that point in time as well. So, uh, if I can use your offices, if I can use the, the, this um, uh, forum to get that message to those individuals, um, you know, this is a matter of as a matter of time again, column rather than than anything they have to be concerned about. Well, I, I welcome I welcome your undertaking to engage, to particularly the undertaking to engage with the families because we have been contacted by families to say that they are they do feel that they're they're kind of in the dark again. So that would be no, very that, and again it, it's where we were in, in regards to, to officials working in other other departments and other structures through through the pandemic. So there's nothing. Okay, and I suppose just to reiterate um, the fact that 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 we are. Probably, unfortunately, far from, from out of this situation yet. The World Health Organization has said to nations, um, this is not a time to relax, this is a time to prepare. Yeah. In, in that respect, are you confident that we will be ready for any second spike that emerges and that lessons learnt will be implemented? I, I'm a, a, as confident as to where, where we are, are now. Um, Chair, the changes that we're making through the restructuring will, will leave us in a far better place um, than we were um, back in February, because we didn't know. There was no rule book, there was no guideline as to how this how this pandemic could be managed, how it could be or expected to spread. So we will we will be in a better place. I hope we get to a position where we don't have a second wave or a second spike, and that's the I suppose the crux and the focus of our work at this moment in time. Okay. Small point, Jerry. Small yeah, just point. a quick point. Thanks, Minister. Um, we've been contacted about uh, victims of the neurology recall um, um, inquiry. Or the, the inquiry. Um, previously, they were told that um, Mr. Bengali and Mr. Jackie Johnson would meet them. Obviously, things have developed right. in the okay. um, Is there any way that uh, those um, people who have um, been involved in acquiring their concerns can be relatively soon? Uh, Your request, noted, Jerry. It's not something that, but no, we'll get it on the record. I'm sure if it's feedback from the committee, 
from the follow-up from that, so I'll take a okay. we'll take it here as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Chief Medical Officer, and thank you, Minister, for your presentations here today and for your answers to the committee. And we wish you well in the in the days and weeks ahead as you continue your important work in relation to our very uh, very valuable and and extremely under pressure health service. Thank you. Very very much. Much. Thank okay. you. Okay, members. Um, members, I now propose that we we'll go back to um, our previous items of business. We will be seeking to get an official from the department on the line. Hopefully, that can be done while we're moving through some of these items. If not, we may have to take a short pause to get the official on the line. But for now, I propose we we'll go back. Can I just check on the phone briefly? Have we someone joined us by phone? Okay, Nigel. Yeah, thank you. And do we have anyone else on the phone? Uh, Colin, can I check? Are you still there with us on the phone? No, I don't think we have anyone else. So, Nigel, we're going to go through a couple of items of business here, and we'll be with you very shortly for your presentation. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, members. So, um, There's no chairperson's business to report this week. I'll move then to the draft minutes. And can I refer members to the revised draft minutes of the meeting held on 25th of June, which are tabled on your table papers there. The revised minutes contain a minor correction regarding the attendance of officials. Um, are members content with those minutes? Yeah. yeah, members content. Can I advise members then that there are no matters arising from the minutes? So moving on to item we are going then, we have taken item five. We have taken item five and we are moving then to item six. And uh, I propose we take item six together with additional item 11 in the, in the table papers. So item six is SR 2020 forward slash 109. The Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment number seven, Regulations NA 2020. And additional item 11 on table papers, which is SR 2020-118, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment Number 8, Regulations NA 2020. I refer members to the papers at tab 6 of the pack and tab 11 in table papers. The Department here has made two further statutory rules under the Emergency Procedure of the Public Health Act 1967 to provide for further easements of restrictions. The Department has advised that due to the urgency of the situation addressed by the SR, there was no time to bring SL1s to the Committee. The Examiner of Statutory Rules has not yet reported these SRs, which are both subject to the confirmatory procedure. Can I advise members that a departmental official has joined us via teleconference to brief the Committee on the regulations? And I would now like to welcome Mr Nigel McMahon, Chief Environmental Officer. To Nigel, can you please go ahead and brief the meeting? Um, the committee are very familiar by now uh, with the fact that the restriction regulations require that as soon as the department considers any of the restrictions or requirements set out in the regulations no longer necessary um, to prevent, protect against, control or provide a public health response to the incidence or spread of coronavirus in Northern Ireland, then they should be withdrawn. There have now been nine sets of amendment regulations made that give effect to the executive's decisions on the continuing need for restrictions and requirements. And the committee today is considering amendment regulations numbers seven and eight. And I'll take those uh, um, together if that's okay. Um, SR 2020-109, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment number seven regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. Uh, were made on the 22nd of June and were commenced at 11 p.m. on the 22nd of June. And the regulations allow groups of up to six people, not from the same household, to be able to meet indoors. It's recommended that social distancing should still be maintained, along with other mitigations such as ventilation and good hygiene. SR 2020 number 118 the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment uh, Number 8 regulations, uh, Northern Ireland 2020, were made on the 25th of June, and the various changes that they introduce have a number of different commencement dates associated with them. 
In summary, then, the nine main changes introduced by the number eight amendments are to allow travel to holiday homes and second homes from the 26th of June, to allow the indoor training facilities uh, used by elite athletes to open from the 26th of June, to allow places of worship to resume religious services other than baptism ceremonies and certain marriage ceremonies and Bible readings from the 29th of June, to allow self-catering tourist accommodation to open from the 26th of June and hotels and other catered accommodation from the 3rd of July, to allow visitor attractions, excluding museums and galleries, to open from the 3rd of July, to allow restaurants, cafes and coffee shops to open from the 3rd of July, to allow pubs and bars to be open from the 3rd of July with restrictions, that is that alcohol may only be served indoors if accompanied by a main table meal. It is permissible to serve alcohol on its own outdoors, but in both cases customers must be seated at tables and not at the bar. Provisions are made for hotel restaurants, hotel bars and outdoor hotel spaces to be open from the 3rd of July with similar restrictions. Certain close contact services, including nail, beauty, or hair salons, barber shops, or shops providing tanning, electrolysis, or acupuncture services can be open from the 6th of July. There's a consequential amendment to Regulation 7 on enforcement to allow for the enforcement of Regulation 6A on outdoor gatherings and 6B in respect of outdoor marriages and civil partnerships regardless of any future changes to the maximum number of people that may be present. And finally, there's a consequential amendment to Part 2 of Schedule 2 to clarify that although hotels may reopen, spas and conference facilities within hotels may not be open at present. Um, thank you for listening to the summary uh, of the amendments. I'm happy to try and answer any questions that members may have. Okay, um, Nigel, thank you for that. Can you just clarify for me what the impact of that amendment to 6A was? Yes, Chair, um, you be aware of the, um, the previous issue we discussed about yeah. the uh, uh, previous omission, yeah. where the changes in the uh, numbers were not linked to the uh, enforcement provisions and the difficulties that that caused. So, We've made an amendment to that that essentially says that um, the enforcement provisions re uh, apply to both those regulations um, in, in future. Um, so 6A on outdoor gatherings and 6B on outdoor civil marriages and partnerships. And what that means in practice is that um, if there are, if the executive decide to change the maximum numbers permitted to um, be present or attend in either of those cases, um, uh, we won't need to amend the regulations uh, each time to um, to reflect that in the other in the enforcement parts of the regulations. Yeah, because you you are aware that there was there was concerns raised around that, and, and it's my understanding actually that the ombudsman is now looking into some of the issues surrounding that, um, in in terms of the enforcement of that. So I think it continues to to cause some concern and is is obviously being looked at by a number of of bodies. I'm going to go ahead now to members' questions. I'll go first of all to Jerry. Uh, thanks, Chair. Sure. Thanks, Nigel. Um, last or Thursday, was it a few days ago, um, I asked you about the science guiding the previous amendments um, being proposed, and, uh, and we didn't get it. So I, I would like to see if we can get some clarity uh, on that. Uh, the Minister just a few minutes ago said we're, we're not through the pandemic. Unfortunately, that's uh, still the case, and, and I'm concerned that people are being forced back into work uh, in certain sectors with no clear scientific rationale, guidance, uh, or confirmation as to why it's safe to do so. And it's not just my own concern, or people uh, concerned about back to work. We saw the scenes obviously in Leicester, where people uh, are at the, the council uh, are making decisions to effectively implement measures of the lockdown again. Germany, uh, regions of Germany as well, uh, going back to implementing measures of the lockdown. So I'm concerned we're moving very, very quickly, and I've no, we had no rational uh, scientific reason last week, and I haven't heard anything uh, this week. Can I talk? I think the, I'm right in saying that at the end of the committee session, the last 
time, uh, the committee said that they would write to the department on that particular point, along with a number of others. Um, and I think I saw that piece of correspondence come in this morning. So um, obviously, it'd be uh, uh, colleagues in other parts of the department will, will respond uh, in due course to the various queries raised by the committee the last time, of which the publication of scientific guidance was was one. Um, I'm also aware that the, the minister and chief medical officer were with the committee uh, a short time ago. I, I, I didn't see that proceeding, uh, but uh, they, they may have attempted to uh, clarify matters on that as well. According to the chair, I mean, to be fair and, and to be honest, I don't think the onus is on the health committee. I, mean, I think the department, when they're uh, proposing changes, uh, serious changes to legislation, to provide some, some guidance and uh, some scientific rationale for the boss. Okay, thank you. Um, I have no other indications from members at the minute here, Nigel. So thank you for that. We can we can let you go ahead there. Thank you, Nigel. Okay. okay. Just let's put let's yeah. yeah. Uh, so members, I'll now go ahead. If there's no other issues raising, I just now to formally put those two both to the meeting. So uh, SR 2020 forward slash 109, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment Number Seven Regulations. And I um, so have uh, on that basis, can I ask members to formally agree that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 109, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment Number 7 Regulations, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Report, recommends that it be approved by the Assembly. Members content? Sure, can I just say, I just, I'm concerned that we're being asked repeatedly to endorse. Um, amendments and um, parts of it were fine, parts of it aren't fine, and there's no clear um, scientific uh, basis uh, given to that. So I have concerned endorsing uh, parts of regulations for, for that reason. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on then to the next SR, which is the one in relation to food and drink, elite athletes, holiday accommodation, and allowing places of worship to open. The Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 118. The Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment Number 8 Regulations, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, recommends that it be approved by the Assembly. Are members content? Yeah. Content. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, Chair, Sorry, just to check if, if the committee did actually formally take a position on the previous one there. I think Gary came in and made his point. I'm not sure if the, the question. The members answered. The members the had. Question. The members had answered, and then Jerry raised his. Yes, the members had had uh, indicated that they were content. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we're now moving the members to correspondence, and I refer members to correspondence tab seven of the pack and table papers under the correspondence memo at tab seven point one. Just to draw attention to a couple of items, there, members. Item seven point two is from a chart from the Birthways charity seeking support from the All Ireland Midwifery for the establishment of an all Ireland midwifery unit network and this is an area where I think actually here in the north we excel in that we have maybe nine midwifery led units but that same concept in the south is struggling and there has been I think European funding um, allocated to allow a, a, a kind of an, an all Ireland network. Are members content to write to the Ministers of Health North and South to express support for that proposal? Yep, members content. Item 7.3 is correspondence from an individual regarding a media article on care home finances. Are members content to note that item? Yeah, thank you. Item 7.4 is from an individual concerned about small outbreaks of COVID-19 in the Ards and North Down area. Are members content to note? Members content. 7.5 is from an individual regarding difficulties faced by healthcare staff who cannot work due to lack of childcare or other provision for dependents due to the pandemic. Um, are members any any comments on that, or would members be content to write back advising the committee has already written to the department on that very issue as it was raised by the Royal College of Nursing? Would you be content for that, members? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Item seven point seven then is correspondence from an individual regarding the neurology recall. Um, any comments in relation to that? Just sure. I thought it was important to raise it with the minister to put it on his own radar. So. So we, we write to the minister a request in that um, I think it's Jackie Johnson uh, is the official and the permanent secretary um, those families as, as quickly as possible. Yeah. And could we also ask to, to inquire what meetings have taken place as a result of, of the commitment to see what, what if any meetings have taken place? Yeah. Okay, thank you. 
Item 7.8 then is a request from the Director of the Children's Law Centre to meet with the Chair. Um, I'm happy to take that, we'll be allowed to take that meeting, and indeed, um, if the Deputy Chair is free, I'll also extend that invitation across. Okay, if members are content with that, we'll go ahead with that. Are members otherwise then content with the actions as noted in the main correspondence memo? Yeah, members content. So there are two items then in table correspondence. 7.9 is the latest report from the Examiner of Statutory Rules. And I remind members that the committee approved SR 2020-96 and SR 2020-103 at previous meetings, subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report. These rules are being debated today in the Chamber. The Examiner has now made her report on these regulations and has no issues to raise. So are members content with the Examiner's report? Item 7.10 is a response from the Minister to issues raised by a member during the plenary debate on mental health and wellbeing after COVID-19 on 23rd of June, relating to the publication of figures on the prevalence of coronavirus cases and the responses there in the pack. Are members content to note that response? Yeah. So the forward work programme then, are uh, members refer members to the draft forward work programme at tab 8. Are members content to note the forward work programme? And so members, that takes us on to any other business. Do members have any other business today? And I can advise the meeting in that case. The next meeting will take place on 10.30 a.m. on Thursday, 9th of July, 2020, room to be confirmed. Thank you, members. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.